He's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with over 27 years of experience. And he's Howard Eibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And together we're the Brief Brothers, and we're having an ongoing discussion about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. Well, we're back, Howard. We've been doing a little uh, creative brief reverse engineering recently, and I think we both find it rewarding and fun yes. to kind of look at campaigns and and try to deduce what was going on strategically uh, ahead of the creative work that might have led to the creative work. And today, I thought we would do something different, and that's look at a classic campaign from BMW, um, the campaign, The Ultimate Driving Machine. I think we've referenced it before in other episodes. To me, it is one of the greatest ad campaigns of all time. And the reason I it was kind of on my mind was I've been restoring a classic BMW from 1975, and it's it's been a long, painful process, and the car's almost ready. So I've had it on my mind, and I, I posted an old-timey ad from BMW from 1974 on LinkedIn, and with a along with a picture of the the car I'm restoring. And it got me to thinking, well, why not do this reverse engineering on, on, on this campaign? So, but before we start kind of talking about the advertising and doing the reverse engineering, uh, I thought it would be good to kind of give some of the background, what, what led up to this campaign. Um, so, first of all, at the time, BMW in the early 70s was a brand um, that had been around a while, but frankly was nowhere in terms of sales. In terms of European vehicles in the United States, um, it was like 10th or 11th. So not imports, European imports, it was like 10th or 11th. Um, they didn't sell a lot of units. I think the dealers were becoming increasingly distraught. Um, and, you know, company based in Germany, it's a different culture. Uh, and so the, the dealers started wanting to make a change of direction in terms of, of advertising. And so they had, there was an RFP, um, several big name agencies. I can't remember all the ones that were involved. I was reading about this earlier. Um, but one of the agencies that got asked to participate was uh, an agency called Amirati Puris Avrit. Tuck, I think is the way to pronounce it, but we're just going to ca call it uh, Amirati for short. Uh, and they were invited to pitch. They were actually part of YNR. They were like a conflict shop within YNR. Um, and the two uh, main guys, Amirati and Puris, had kind of generated some fame for themselves doing work for Fiat. Um, they had like some clever, really clever advertising for Fiat that. Uh, that was noteworthy. And so they got invited into this pitch. And at the moment that they got invited to the pitch and you could, you read different accounts of it. They had like a week to 10 days worth of operating capital left. Like it just, they, this agency was going out of business. Um, so, uh, and they came up basically with one of the most legendary ad campaigns, save, save the agency. The agency In the later, time. Yeah, later the agency got merged into different, uh, agencies and you know its remnants still exist today, though not the the, the name. Um, so that was that was what was going on, and so I thought maybe we could uh, show this uh, uh, ad that we were looking at earlier. It's it's kind of a uh, emblematic of the campaign. I'm not sure that. I read somewhere this was the first ad, but I'm not really sure that it was the first ad. But I think it's a good one to kind of uh, to, to give us a, a reference for what the campaign is as we start talking about the brief. Yeah, and so, I think, I think Henry, one of the things you, you mentioned early on in our conversation that what's different about this reverse engineering exercise, and I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the first time we're showing print ads and we're really focusing on the importance, the true importance of the writing, because uh, this is long copy, a format. First of all, there's print advertising is, well, it's not dead, but it's certainly not as prominent as it was in the 70s when these ads came out. Um, and long copy is, it's rare. You, you just don't see it anymore. 
So we've, you and I have talked about the value and the importance of good writing when you do a brief. Here is the public version of good writing in long copy ads. So that's another thing that makes this exercise slightly different from other, other reverse engineering things we've done. A hundred percent. So th this is the, the first ad uh, or that first ad we're going to show. It says our status symbol is under the hood, not on it. And then it says, the from, we're just going to read the first few lines. In all candor, the BMW is not everyone's idea of an expensive luxury sedan. It does not scream money from the top of its hood. It is not the longest or widest or chromiest, nor does its interior resemble that of an Edwardian salon. Yeah, and you know what I love about that is it's gutsy enough to say, well, maybe the audience doesn't even know what an Edwardian salon is, but we're going to trust them to either figure it out, look it up, or just ex acknowledge that it's yeah, that, something different. That they should probably know. And I think if you know what a salon is, you know that it's something fancy. And But but can you, can you imagine someone somewhere along the line saying, wait a minute, nobody knows what that is. Where are we saying that? And the creatives or somebody said, so what? We want to, you know, David Ogilvy used to say, um, never underestimate the intelligence of your audience. Now there's a second half to that, which doesn't play very well because he said it in the forties. The second half of that is she is your wife. Yeah. But it's still the same point. It's just, it's the person who goes out to the market, to the store, to the showroom who actually buys this thing. Don't underestimate their intelligence. We're not stupid. Yep. So, um, if, as we think about a brief, the first thing we might think about is what the objective of the advertising is. Mm -hmm. And we already, I already kind of alluded to what I, I think here. I mean, it, it was basically to put the BMW brand on the map because it right. literally, it literally was nowhere. Make the brand famous. Um, in, a, in, then, a, in a time, in a time before that was even an idea, make us famous. It wasn't an idea, but it had been done, right? Like right. Bill Bernbach had done it with Volkswagen. Mm -hmm. um, and so here, I think the idea was really to uh, to create an image for BMW that would be true to the product um, and that would appeal to the target. And that's this next thing I want to talk about. Who's the target audience? Well, wait a minute. Before we, before we do that, I just want to go back and say, because this is something I've seen bandied about a little bit online among people who are saying that they have, uh, they know a thing or two about briefs. Do you think this brief had a singular objective? Make us famous? Or were there multiple objectives? I have an opinion on that. Um, I suspect it had a singular objective, which was turn the ship around. Yes. Um, Can a brief have more than one objective? Uh, it shouldn't because a piece of communication yeah. is really difficult to do that. And I agree. And I think but when you have when you have multiple, you have to figure out what's the common thing between them because there's usually something bigger. And here, this was big. How much bigger can you get than? make our brand relevant and known. But I, the reason I asked the question, I'm being a little, you know, maybe I'm, I'm being obtuse. There are, I've seen enough briefs with multiple objectives. Sometimes they're basically saying the same thing in three different ways, but I have a rule of thumb when I see it, when I talk about writing a brief, you should have one objective one problem, one objective, one target audience, one single-minded proposition. If you have a second of any of those, it's time for a new brief. But I've seen that rule violated many, many times. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically being a little persnickety here, but because it's such a clear objective that we've identified for this project, it just drives home the point of how valuable and how important that line needs to be. Yep. So keep going. So so I was saying the, the, the target audience for this and, you know, in doing some of the research and, and reading about this campaign, um, you know, this was the early 70s, 73, 74. Um, so what do we have? We have baby boomers mm -hmm. that are now professionals um, and particularly some 
late era pre-boomers, like from 1940, like they're now uh, by 73, they're 33 years old, right? Like this is a, a group that is in its late 20s, early 30s. They're college educated because they they were the product of the baby boom and, and that period of prosperity. It was like the first generation that was really went to college en masse. Um, it was the, uh, they had lived through the booming economic times of the 50s and 60s, and now they were entering the workforce as professionals um, with, and had disposable income. So uh, to me, the, the target here, and, and I read a New York Times article about it, and, and they talked about um, affluent activists. Now, this isn't something that, that Purist, the copywriter, or Amirati said, or, or, but like we always talk about how we sometimes we can put like a little name to the target to kind of mm -hmm. be descriptive. Well, yeah. I really liked the way that the Times talked about this affluent activists, right? These were, these were the people that had protested the Vietnam War in college. They were the, but now they were, these are essentially the proto yuppies. Um, and, yeah, and, and an affluent activist in the 70s is an entirely different creature than an affluent activist in the 2020s. A hundred percent. We got it. We just got to clarify that. A hundred percent. But uh, but I thought it was interesting. So if I were writing a target description, I would talk about, you know, how they were college educated. They were products of the post-war boom, um, mm -hmm. how they um, had were gaining sophisticated tastes. Um, and they were in the market for higher end vehicles. Um, and then just as important as who the target was, I thought one of the interesting things that I read about was they took the car to like a country club. They took a BMW to the country club and nobody there liked it. And what they realized was like that the older consumers, like the ones that were older than those boomers who happen to be young, um, they didn't, they, their idea of luxury was something completely different. Big. It was, it was block big long. cars that were very, that were, that would, that had very floaty suspensions and so forth. So the contrast between this car and that car, though they, those cars, although the prices were comparable, mm -hmm. there were, there were huge, huge differences. Right. Um, so to me, I, I think that the identifying that this target audience wa was looking for a new kind of luxury um, would be something that I would have put in a, in a, in a target description. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What what you know? You were going to say something, or yeah, I was just going to say you identified the objective. I think really spot on accurately. If we backed up and asked the question, "What's the problem that we're trying to solve? That this campaign is trying to solve?" How would it be a broader or more narrow? What do you think? Would the objective narrow? I think it's, uh, and I, I'm just thinking about it now as you ask the question. I, I think we start narrowing because ultimately how we're going to make them famous is by um, creating a niche for this brand that only it can occupy, right? Um, based on what the product actually is. And which kind of gets to the, I guess, skipping around, like I well, we talk about sometimes right. I skip around when I'm writing a brief. Right. You go to the reasons to believe. So let's say we don't have a single-minded proposition, but we start looking at reasons to believe that we go to the product to say well what is this product about what are its characteristics what, what's good about it and so you drive the car and you see wow you know for an expensive luxury car this car has incredible handling it has a performance engine to it um, it was designed by race engineers it was um, you know uh, had different styling than than other comparable vehicles in terms of price and all so the, all you start the things, saying, oh, okay. all the things that a big El Dorado Cadillac would not have or a Lincoln or, or a even Lincoln. a Mercedes or even a Mercedes at the time. Right. Um, so the question, so then it's like, okay, so what are the, together these characteristics promising 
and then you get to a single-minded proposition, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not going to, and by the way, we don't even know if there was a brief written for this. Right. You know, the, the, there was an RFP. They said, we want you to pitch ideas and this might've been just done all, all on the fly. But the ultimate driving machine ended up being the tagline. It ended up being the core of the campaign, the heart of the campaign. Um, if we don't want to be as obnoxious as to say that that was the single-minded proposition, I think it would have been some proto version of the ultimate driving machine um, that would have led a smart copywriter like Martin Puris to come up with the line, the ultimate driving machine. The, the right? germ so of it. The germ of it may have existed in the brief, but you know, even if they didn't have a brief that we understand as we understand it, uh, let's let's just put that aside for a moment and do this exercise as if they had a brief, because that's the point of what we do here. Exactly. Let's just say they had the 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 formats that we're accustomed to seeing or versions of them, and do this as an exercise. So when I ask the question about you know, okay, what's the problem and what's the objective, which are in the same sector. If not in the same, there are different questions. You know, one of the things that came to mind for me was something unique about American Express back in the 70s, which had a kind of what we called in the direct response world, uh, the velvet rope appeal. In other words, you were on one side of the velvet rope and members of American Express were on the other side. Because if you remember back in the day, American Express tagline was membership has its privileges. It was, they were the ones who really introduced the whole concept of well, it's not a it's not a credit card. It's a bank card. You got to pay your bill at the end of the month. And then they had other features that they introduced. And this whole idea of a velvet rope meant that there are some people who aren't going to qualify. So does that? I'm wondering if that had if that attitude was relevant to what BMW was trying to create in its little niche that you talked about, and made it different from other. Look so let's talk about American Express first, because I think it's, it's a great point. I think the, the other thing, and you said membership has its privileges, but that the whole idea that you're not a customer, you're a member. This is yeah. a club that you're right. a part of is, right. is something that, that distinguishes you. On the BMW side, I think it doesn't have to do with affluence or wealth. I think the club that you're a part of or that you're belonging to is that fraternity of people that really like to drive, that like right. the driving experience. And so I was thinking of a single-minded proposition that maybe a, a strategist or somebody, uh, an account person would have come up with, which would have been a, a, you know, a pretty basic promise about a B BMW is the car for people who love driving or, right. or, for, the, or for a driving enthusiast. Right. And then the reasons to believe are the ones we outline. You know, it's a, a, designed by race engineers. It, uh, it has the independent suspension. It has all of these bells and whistles that create this experience that then somebody smart like Martin Purse came up and said the ultimate driving machine. If we introduce the idea of luxury into that sentence, would that be adding a second idea? I think so. Yeah. Because that's what they're saying in the first couple of lines of the of the body copy that you read. It's it's not the luxury card that you think of that screams, you know, that screams. It doesn't scream luxury, but it does remind you of the Edwardian salon. So we are talking about luxury in a car that's designed by race I, drivers. I think I think the the work and probably the brief um, take they take the fact that BMW is already in kind of the luxury space as a given right so they don't need to and they're and they, they it recognizes um uh it recognizes the fact that they're not going to compete on those luxury terms that most people see as luxury and i want to clarify it says nor does its interior resemble that of an edwardian salon so it's not a rolls royce this isn't a right. rolls royce we're pointing out frankly the way that vw did saying you know the things that it isn't right. Like you're, if that's what you're looking for, you're not going to get it with us. Yeah. It's a different breed of luxury. It's a, but, it's a luxury, it's a luxury car that can move. But on the other hand, if what you think a luxury car should be is a pleasure to drive and exhilarating to drive, then this vehicle is for you. Right. And so I think we've talked about objective. We've talked about target audience. 
Um, we've talked about a uh, single-minded proposition along with some reasons to believe, support for that. And another important thing that, that you can see from the campaign, and we'll, I'll read out some of the headlines because they're, they're really good and we'll, we'll throw them up on the screen, um, is tone, right? Oh, I so was. Gonna, I was. I, this... I, I like. I like the idea of tone, but I. Are we can we also address insight? Can we draw some conclusions about what the insights were? You've you've hinted at some of the things when we talked about who the target audience is. I think the target audience is going to be a, a, a beacon, a bellwether for what the insight is, because that's what they were reading. Who? What? What is it about this vehicle that's going to really be attracted to the attracted to this audience? Um, so, but, but let's talk about tone first. So, but I think we want to come back to insight. That's fine. Um, I think that on uh, on tone, um, I think that brash is the word that comes to mind. Brash um, with the B. Yeah, brash. I love it. Yeah, I um, like that. because essentially that's what what we see in this work. I mean, it's it's it's, and it's, I think, um, indicative of the audience, right? Again, younger, irreverent. Um, mm -hmm. understanding these are the people that, you know, would later give us things like SNL and, uh, National Lampoon and, and they were the, the counterculture. So I think a little bit in your face and brash was probably the tone. And that's, that's the tone, the campaign, uh, was through its through its golden age. Um, I, I was going to say cocky and confident, but I think brash summarizes that even better. I like that a lot. In, in one word. So here's yeah. here's a couple of the the ads um, to kind of that illustrate that tone. Now you don't have to trade in your family to own a sports car. Perhaps the only luxury coupe whose performance lives up to its price. Maybe you wouldn't be so anxious to trade in your present car if you actually enjoyed driving it. Right, like making you question um, the current vehicle you're in. Be one of the 1,200 fastest families in America, right? So, saying just because you have a family and need a vehicle to transport them around doesn't mean that you have to give up uh, automotive performance. The, these uh, are examples of ads that our friend and former uh, past guest Greg Benedict does in his little thing on on linkedin great advertising oh how i miss you right yeah um this is i mean i keep i keep coming back to this because i worked on the account de decades ago for for lexus you compare this kind of stuff that bmw has done for its brand to what lexus is doing now and you just shake your head and go what the heck happened mm -hmm. now this is this is when an i we've talked about this before this is when an idea drove a campaign Going back to the insight, and I hadn't yeah. really, and I hadn't really thought about it. But while you asked me, a light bulb went off in my head, and I would have to meditate on it more. But I was thinking, okay, so we have this target of, and we call them, I think, uh, activist, uh, affluent activists, Active, right? affluent activists, right? Uh, uh, and that we said that they're kind of leading this counterculture. Um, uh, I think that the insight is something like this target rejects a lot of societal norms. Yes. And so it, because they're rich, but they're rejecting the traditional rich norms. And so that would create like the need for this brash brand that provides something different than what traditional luxury provides. I, I like that. I like that a lot. It really fits with the time you know the in the height or yeah the height of the or the near the tail end of the vietnam war so that would that had a deep influence on the way that generation which is my generation viewed uh, material things but this was an affluent sector of that audience who didn't want to let go of that activist protest mentality so how do i justify having a car like this well it's you know it is a statement in itself. It's not the luxury car that the daddy man let, drives. Let the man drive a Cadillac. Yeah, exactly. I'm not exactly. the man. I'm not the man. I like that a lot. Yeah. And by the man, we mean the man who's 
puts his foot on other people's necks and things like that. Right, right, right exactly. In, in the time, which was the, you know, the, the people in power at the time, right, running the war, yeah. corporate America. Okay. All right. We've got, we've got a, a good look at a possible brief for an iconic campaign. We're going to throw up examples of the work. I'd say good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez. And he's Howard Eibach. And together we're the Brief Brothers. Till next time. Bye-bye.